Good morning and welcome to Business Morning. It's the last edition for the month and, of course, the first quarter of the year. Thank you for joining us. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. And I'm Ladi Williams. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Uh, let's uh, take a look at what's happening in news. The outlook on Nigeria's banking system will remain negative, reflecting the expectations of rising asset risk and uh, weakening government support capacity over the next 12 to 18 months. And that's according to Moody's. Moody says Nigerian banks' loans quality will weaken in 2021 as coronavirus support measures implemented by the government and central bank last year, including the loan repayment holiday, are unwound. The negative outlook also captures the weakening capacity of the government of Nigeria to support the country's banks in case of need, as reflected by the negative outlook on the government's uh, credit rating. On the other hand, Moody says Nigerian banks hold robust capital buffers and foreign currency shortages will ease. And the Senate Committee on Local and Foreign Debt is asking the Ministries of Agriculture, Finance and the Debt Management Office to furnish it with more details before it approves the sum of 995 million euros and 1.5 billion dollars foreign loans. The federal government is seeking foreign loans for the execution of the Green Imperative Program for mechanized farming and provision of critical infrastructure across the 36 states of the Federation to manage the COVID-19 pandemic. This is an interface between executives from the Ministries of Agriculture, Finance and the Debt Management Office and the Senate Committee on Local and Foreign Debts to discuss the federal government's 2016 to 2018 external borrowing plan. Costs have been put in the past toward uh, issue of mechanization. Specifically, they are to furnish the committee with details of what the 995 million euros and 1.5 million dollars foreign loans will be used for. We were able to approve item A, but for item B and C, it was not possible because of lack of proper information as to what that money will be used for. The Minister of Agriculture explains that the loan will be used for an agricultural program to provide mechanized farming for optimized food production in the country. Well, this program of green imperative and understanding between the Brazilian government and Nigerian government. This is intended to provide at least 10,000 directors over the next three years and another set of 10,000 directors in another three years. However, so committee members much, uh, are worried about the implementation of the program, but the minister tries to assuage their management. fears. A lot of efforts have been put in the past toward the uh, issue of mechanization, but uh, I must say here, without any fear of contradiction, that it has not actually benefited the real farmers. And we want to know, how will this program be different from other previous programs? My concern here is that you have not even been able to identify the real farmers. We are talking about those who are going to use the tractors or they are not trained. Yes, we know where our farmers are now. Within the last, it's not up to a year, we have registered 5.8 million farmers across the country. On the $1.5 billion loan being sought for the 36 states government and the federal capital territory for infrastructure to manage the COVID-19 pandemic, the committee chairman asked the director general of the debt management office to furnish them with a document relating to the credit worthiness of the states. The Minister of Agriculture is also to provide the committee with details of the planned execution of the Green Imperative Program, which the loan is sought for. Linda Kibi, Channels Television News. And on the global oil market, uh, prices rose, pairing overnight losses a day ahead of a meeting of OPEC and its allies. When investors betting producers will largely agree to extend their supply curbs into May, Brent crude futures rose 15 cents to $64.29 a barrel after falling 1.3% on Tuesday. U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude futures jumped 15 cents to $60.70 a barrel after falling 1.6% in the previous session. The Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries and Allies, together called OPEC Plus, are set to meet on Thursday following a month in which oil prices have whipsawed and concerns about extended pandemic lockdowns in Europe. 
slow vaccine rollout and rising COVID-19 cases in India and Brazil pitted against uh, growing optimism on growth in the United States. And back here with well over 187 trillion cubic feet of gas reserves, Nigeria ranks as the largest in natural gas reserves in Africa with another additional 600 trillion cubic feet of unproven potential resources. The commodity is said to have enormous potential to diversify the Nigerian economy. It is for this reason that President Muhammadu Buhari on Monday launched the country's The Decade of Gas in Nigeria, uh, which is aimed at transforming Nigeria into an industrialized nation with the help of the gas sector. How can the federal government and stakeholders in the energy industry maximize the decade of gas to transform the Nigerian economy? Dr. Ayodeleoni, oil and gas expert and partner energy practice group at Bloomfield Law Practice, joins us next. And Dr. Ayodeleoni joins us now. Dr. Ayodeleoni is a partner energy practice group, Bloomfield Law Practice. Dr. Oni, great to have you on the program. Thank you very much for having me. Good morning. So uh, 2020 was declared the year of gas, and here we are launching the uh, decade of gas. How significant is this, uh, considering that Nigeria is an oil and gas nation, uh, but seems to have focused more on oil uh, over the years? Well, I think Nigeria is more of a gas country, a gas province with some oil. Uh, we're currently um, ninth in the world uh, with our proven reserves, P1 of over, a little over 200 trillion cubic feet of gas. Uh, if the unproven reserves can be proved according to SEC rules, we will then be about fourth in the, in the, in the world. So it's significant. We've got comparative advantage. We've got, we can power industrialization. We can do a lot. And government is not just looking at policy. Government is also working the talk. There's quite a bit going on in terms of infrastructure. So it's quite important and it's significant um, to the country. I think it's, it's very important. We're a gas province only with some oil. Using global demand for cleaner energy sources has offered Nigeria an opportunity to exploit gas resources for the good of the country. How can Nigeria seize this opportunity? Okay, there's a lot the government can do. There's a lot Nigeria can do. First, is to ensure that there are incentives. For me, less is more. We should regulate less in terms of pricing and encourage uh, more investment in, time, in terms of having incentives so that more people can invest. And government is doing quite a bit in terms of uh, providing the infrastructure backbone. For example, we have the Ajaokuta Kaduna Kano. It's a 614 kilom uh, kilometers pipeline system that would move from Ajaokuta to Kaduna and to Kano. And at some point, would also link with Algeria so that we can sell some of our gas um, internationally. Similar to what you see Qatar doing with its gas. For a long time, Qatar was a fishing country. But now with gas, it's been able to power its economy and arguably the richest country in the world as we speak. So there's a lot government can do and government is doing. You know, typically, you will start with policy. And there are a number of policies government has had. For example, the uh, gas master plan, policies and plans. There's also the gas expansion program. There's quite a bit government is doing in terms of policy. Now, policies are by themselves not justiciable. You usually can't go to court to enforce. So there are also regulations, like the domestic pricing regulations, regulations government has passed to enforce those policies. And it's not just also having those regulations. You also want to show that you mean business. That's why we have the AKK project. That's the Ajakota Kaduna project. We have the expansion of the Alps. That's the Escravos Lagos pipeline to supply gas, take gas from Niger Delta to Lagos to other parts of um, Southwest Nigeria. You also have the Oben. There's a lot too of Oben going on. So a lot is going on in terms of infrastructure. Once government can provide that backbone can provide that support and incentives, you are sure to be in business. Remember that whether it's transportation via CNG, whether it's cleaner cooking via LPG, liquefied petroleum gas, whether it's um, even for agriculture, you need fertilizer. Gas is a constituent part of fertilizer. So it's just having a synergy of, of policy, regulations, and infrastructure. And you also want to incentivize and, and do less of um, regulating that sector so that players are coming 
play and take advantage. And uh, uh, the, the fact that we've got large volumes is, is a very good advantage for us. And we can truly power industrialization, power the economy with gas. All right, Dr. Oni, at, at the launch of the decade of gas, uh, the president said the NLNG, which contributes about 1% uh, to GDP, has generated $114 billion in revenue over the years and $9 billion in taxes, $18 billion in uh, revenues and uh, in, in dividends to the federal government and $15 billion in, uh, in feed gas. Uh, what's your take on this? Oh yeah, that, that, that does make sense. It's, it's like the flagship, the NLNG is like the flagship. Recall that in about 1999, when the NLNG project was to start, there was a legislation passed just to support that project. And beyond all of that statistics, it's also um, about to pro provide about 12,000 jobs. And government is expecting about $10,000 billion from that project in terms of um, what would come into the country in, in terms of invest, additional investment. So it's really, it's a really important project for gas in, in the country. And that's what, like, like I'd mentioned before, that's what Qatar has done with his um, gas assets um, and then uh, uh, liquefied natural gas projects. And that, that's it. So imagine combining that with pipeline and um, uh, virtual pipeline system. That's going to be, that's going to be really good. If we, if we do take advantage of that. So the NLNG is, is a flagship program and it's been hugely successful and can do more and bring much more, particularly when we then have train eight, nine, and 10. At the moment, we're on train seven and with train seven, about, about 12,000 jobs. That's, and that's mm. significant for a country such as ours. Now, gas to power issues accounts for close to 70% of utilization of gas resources in the local uh, Nigerian environment. Now, this is also one of the most challenging areas for private equity investments in the industry. So what's the root cause of this and what can be done to resolve this? Okay, for a long time, um, gas pricing was an issue. You know, imagine buying, having been forced to sell gas less than your cost of production. So everyone wanted to do an export project rather than utilize gas. That's one of the reasons in 2008, there was the obligation for every gas producer to reserve gas for domestic use. Now the issues with the power sector go beyond gas because recall that gas is only an input. So if electricity tariffs do not take into consideration gas pricing and the tariffs cannot cover gas prices, then you will have a problem people will not invest in gas and people would rather do export projects. So it's more that it's just beyond infrastructure. It's an issue of pricing because it's an input for power generation. If it doesn't take into consideration that input, you'd always have problems. And you also have to deal with broader issues beyond gas. So incentives, infrastructure, pricing are three cardinal issues and the commercial framework generally and a lot is being done in that in, in those in that regard to ensure that everything works seamlessly all right uh, nigeria depends significantly on uh, gas for power generation there are numerous gas fired power stations in nigeria and the main feedstock of these turbines is gas but it's also said that gas is not priced efficiently uh, saying that prices of gas is actually subsidized. How critical is the pricing of gas and the cost of uh, production for Jenkos? Well, it's, it's crucial because it, it, it's a significant portion of, of tariffs. Because when you generate electricity, it's like having a Rolls Royce without fuel. If you have your power plants and you do not have fuel, which is gas in this case, you then can generate electricity. And part of the tariff, the multi-year tariff order, the tariff for the power sector takes into consideration gas pricing. Recall also that gas is generally priced in USD. And so it's critical that you ensure that there isn't a mismatch between the gas price and your electricity tariff. As long as you continue to have that disconnect, or where you don't have um, the electricity tariffs uh, adequately catering to gas pricing, you will never get it right. And you will seldom have sufficient investment in gas and gas infrastructure. It's not sufficient to have gas. You do need infrastructure to move that gas from where it's produced to where it's needed. You also need 
require infrastructure to process that gas to usable to, to usable quality and all of that. So that's important. It's an input to generating electricity. So to the extent that it's an input to generating electricity, the, uh, the price is crucial. And as long as the price isn't catered to, you would still have issues with your with with, with um, the gas sector. Right, we're talking about um, growing the economy um, through gas now, trying to diversify away from oil. Now, how important is the passage of the PIB now? Okay, the PIB is crucial, to be honest, but I think it's a bit beyond the PIB. Um, a number of these policies, even without the PIB, can move us along pretty quickly. You've got the gas penetration policy where more people are encouraged to use LPG, which is cleaner than, than kerosene or firewood. You've got that policy. You've also got the policy where you, yeah, the auto gas policy, where vehicles are now to use um, CNG. So as long as you have policies, you have an obligation by gas producers to reserve a particular quantity of gas for domestic use. Even without the PIB, even though it's crucial, even without the PIB, PIB we can still make reasonable progress. And one thing, I was, looking at a, 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 I was looking at the version of the PIB, and I was surprised because there wasn't much said about energy transition. Yes, I understand that gas is a transition fuel. Ultimately, the idea is to decarbonize and have renewables, but the PIB, vice crucial, isn't the only part of the jigsaw. We, it's important that government continues to push policy, create incentives, and, and build the infrastructure backbone. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ayodele Oni, for sharing your thoughts with us. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much. We'll take a break, and when we come back, FX Commodities Market Update is next. And while the total value and number of contracts traded on the FX Commodities Market for the week of 23rd to 29th of March went sunnyside, the number of deal, the commodity index, and the export index were in the red. For more, here is Michael Martin. Hello, Michael. Good morning. Good to see you again. So let's just start off the show with um, activities, um, the commodities um, on your exchange in the week under review. Hi, Chimizia. Good morning. Thank you for having me once again. Um, so as you can see from the table in front of you, we had a fair bit of market activity happen in the exchange over the course of the week, uh, with the total value of transactions uh, going up by 112%, from around 0 0.97 billion to close the trading week at 2.06 billion naira. Uh, the total number of contracts traded also went up by 174%, from around 41,000 uh, contracts to close the trading week at more than 112,000 contracts. We are, however, saw red uh, to the tune of 25% on the number of deals traded on the contracts, falling from around 97 deals uh, to close the trading week at just uh, 73 deals. Uh, the ACI, which is the Apex Commodities Index, also fell by 4.57% uh, from around 400.85 to close the trading week at 382.53. The Apex Export Index, which is the AEI, also fell ever so slightly by 0.38% from around 159.95 uh, to close the trading week at 159.35. Uh, with regards to the volume of uh, contracts traded on the exchange, if you look at the next table in front of you, uh, it clearly delineates that maize, uh, soybean and sorghum were the only commodities that traded higher this week uh, in comparison to the previous week. Uh, cocoa and sesame traded little to no volume in the exchange, uh, while other, all the other commodities under consideration traded less uh, volume this week in comparison to the previous week. Uh, with regards to price trading on the exchange, uh, we saw the top gainers uh, being number one, Sogum, uh, which gained 5.50% uh, in the week under review, uh, gaining 1,000 Naira to close the trading week at 19,000 195 Naira per contract. The only other gainer for the week was Paddy Rice, which gained 1.56%, uh, uh, gaining 303 Naira in the contract value to close the trading week at 19,695. 
uh, with regards to the losers for the week, uh, we saw or we saw Maze uh, lose 9.87 percent, uh, losing more than 2,000 naira in the contract value to close the trading week at 18,497 naira uh, per contract. And then the only other loser for the week was uh, Ginger, which lost 0.75 percent. Uh, losing 666, uh, 666 naira in the contract value to close the trading week at 87,862 naira per contract. And the only other asset under consideration is the Fair Trade Exchange Traded Commodity, which is the FETC, uh, which lost about 1.92% uh, over the course of the week, losing 273 naira um, in the contract value uh, to close the trading week at 13,962 naira. Um, so that's by and large all of uh, what happened on the commodities exchange over the course of the week. And like we always say, if you want to know more about the commodities market, you can always go to our website, which is www.apexnigeria.com. And, and at this point, if you're not invested in the commodities market, I honestly don't know what you're doing. So if you want to get started investing in the commodities market, please download our Comex app on the Apple and Google Play Store and get started making some money, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I guess we'll have to give that a, a shot. I, I like to make money, so uh, I'll, uh, I'll take uh, your advice. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, Maze uh, fell by almost 10%. Uh, you dropped there. Is there any particular reason why? Um, so May is dropping by almost 10%. We're seeing that as more of an extension of the grain stabilization program that had happened in the month of February. And May is in particular, had, I mean, had enjoyed months of, uh, of bullish momentum. And we see this as a bit of a retracement uh, before prices continue higher. Um, before prices continue higher. So it's, it's nothing, uh, nothing out of the ordinary for May. Mm. So Sorghum is finally picking up some steam. Are we uh, seeing the introduction <laughs> of major players in that market? Um, essentially, yes. Um, usually, sorghum prices tend to move when you see the introduction of major players like breweries and people who uh, brew alcohol in general. And, and I think, as I commented on also last week, we have a few festivities that are coming up. I mean, mm. Easter is this weekend, and then we also have the Ramadan celebration uh, also coming up. I mean, if I didn't know any better, I would say that people are inclined to drink and want to get drunk. Um, so we're essentially seeing the price of sorghum go, go up by extension because it's a major produce, uh, it's a major commodity used in the brewing of, uh, brewing of alcohol. So, All right, uh, and a much uh, broader note, when analyzing the commodities market, what are the fundamentals to look out for in terms of uh, market signals? Um, so when you're analyzing the, the commodities market in terms of market signals, um, there are a few things that you want to pay attention to, right? And this is for anybody, whether or not you're a retail investor or whether or not you're even a, an institutional investor, right? So first of all, you want to pay attention to price. Price is the most important uh, indicator that you're trying to look at, uh, that you should be evaluating uh, whether or not it's cheap or whether or not it's expensive, whether or not it's overvalued or undervalued. Another indicator or market signal that you always want to pay attention to is volume, right? So what are the, period, what are the time periods when you tend to see large volumes in the market? And then what are the time periods when you tend to see low volumes in the market? And we've discussed this at, at length at, so, you know, at some point in time during the course of this interview, how we tend to make the assertion that for grains in general, you tend to see more volume comes in the, come into the market during harvest periods of uh, October and November and maybe even some part of December and then you tend to see that volume uh, dwindle over time. Um, the only other market signal that you would also be considering would probably also be the general macro, market sentiment for one and that's to say for each of the commodities that you want to invest in whether or not that's maize, soybean, sorghum or paddy rice, <laughs> who are the major players in this, who are the major players in this, uh, in this commodity and when do they come into the market, the capital flows, when does that happen because you also tend to see like we're seeing with, uh, so, like, like we saw with sorghum during the course of this week that price tends to move upwards uh, when you see those players come into the market and I think lastly which I think uh, this is more of a broader macro uh, framework is you want to look at the general macroeconomic uh, uh, environment and with, when it comes to the commodities market the two uh, major market indicators that you're looking at is number one you're looking at the inflation rate and then you're also looking at um, if I'm not completely uh, if I'm not completely I think you're, you might also want to be looking at the interest rate and how it also uh, influences uh, the commodities market and so the inflation uh, rate and, and, and the interest rate uh, those are the market macroeconomic uh, uh, indicators that you would be looking at all right, Martin. Okay, um, away from those uh, numbers, FX's uh, input financing program has been running for over four years now, showing growth year on year in the number of farmers reached mm -hmm. with the program. 
who are enabled to access quality inputs with fertilizers making up a mm -hmm. huge portion of the basket. Can you give mm -hmm. us an overview of fertilizer distribution and usage in Nigeria before the introduction of the PFI and, of course, five years after its introduction? Um, so if you evaluate the way the industry was structured uh, before the Presidential Fertilizer uh, Initiative, uh, a significant portion, if not the entirety, of all the fertilizers that, was used by, that were used by smallholder farmers, uh, a large proportion of them were imported from abroad. Right? And if you look at what has happened, uh, uh, particularly with the exchange rate, also within that same time period, you would argue that the Presidential Fertilizer Initiative was a brilliant initiative. Right? So if you look at how the Naira has been devalued, uh, uh, how the Naira has been devalued uh, with, with, between that same time period, right? What that would have essentially led to in, in the ecosystem was a skyrocketing of the cost of uh, skyrocketing of the cost of fertilizers for not necessarily, not, not just for the small the farmers, but also for every single player within the fertilizer uh, value chain. But more so speaking to the Presidential Fertilizer Initiative, right? Um, so if you look at the way the initiative was structured, it was more of a policy pillar um, during the agriculture uh, promotion uh, program, right? And the program was sort of structured, right, in order to drive the utilization of local uh, domestic blending, uh, 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 domestic blending uh, companies, right? And the reason why that was put into place was essentially to increase production on one end and also to increase access and use of locally blended, domestically blended uh, uh, fertilizers, right? And if you look at the way the scheme was structured, right, it was structured to stand on three legs. Uh, the first of which was number one procurement, the second of which was uh, blending, and the third of which was distributorship, right? So if you look at what has happened, so the first of which is the ability to procure these raw materials both from home and abroad because some of the raw materials are locally available, for example, limestone. Um, Second of which is to say, how then do we convert this locally, uh, this sourced raw materials into the NPK uh, fertilizers by using, using blending services by these domestic blending, uh, by domestic blending companies? And then thirdly is also the distributorship, right, of how uh, we're going to get these finished products, right, from where they're being locally blended to the end, pro uh, to the end user, which is the small, uh, which is the small older farmer. So what All has right. happened in the industry as a result of that is that, okay? Go ahead, go ahead. So what has happened, uh, what, you, what you have seen happen to the industry um, as a result of that is the fact that local production has gone up by uh, approximately 40, uh, 400 percent and local consumption has also gone up by 39 percent within that same time period. And these are figures as reported, as reported in the year uh, 2019. So by and large, you can argue that the Presidential Fertilizer Initiative has been extremely successful no, and not just in that regard, it has also been successful in, the term, in terms of formalizing the interaction right, between all the players within the fertilizer value chain, both from a production standpoint to a distribution uh, standpoint and also to the end user, which is the small older farmer, and thereby increasing uh, his productivity. All right, Martin. So the, the president recently reviewed the progress of the uh, Presidential Fertilizer Initiative, PFI, and of this decision mm -hmm. from the review was the restructuring of the initiative to ensure... It was fully led by the private sector. How will that uh, be a benefit to the commodities ecosystem? Um, so when you evaluate the government's role, and, and this is even regardless of any industry that you're evaluating, right? The government's role has always been about creating a sustainable ecosystem right, that allows different players right, to, come and play, uh, to come and play essentially, right? So what has happened as a result of this new... Uh, policy initiative is the fact that you're seeing the introduction of a lot of private sector players and you're seeing a lot of them starting uh, new businesses in the fertilizer value chain. Um, so before the, even before the presidential fertilizer initiative, we had maybe, maybe just three to four different fertilizer blending facilities in the country. Now they're almost 30. As also as a result of that uh, uh, initiative, we're also seeing a transition away from a service-led uh, blending fee revenue model, models from, for all these blending uh, uh, facilities to a, uh, a margin-based revenue model, right? So what that essentially means is that the blending facilities or the blending companies now, they are responsible for the cost of production, they're responsible for sourcing these raw materials, and then they can now design their own uh, uh, business systems to earn some sort of significant margin uh, on, on the finished products, right? And if, you, and if you look at what has happened, as a result of that initiative alone, we have seen, number one, we have seen increased competition within, that, uh, within the blending uh, uh, facility, uh, with blending facilities in general, 
right? You're seeing a lot more. You're seeing a lot more players within that same value chain, which of course essentially also leads to uh, a reduction in the price of the end product, which is fertilizer. Secondly, you're also seeing an increase in production of uh, locally blended fertilizer as a result of the introduction of a lot of players within that uh, value chain. And lastly, which I think is also important from a broader economic uh, standpoint, is also to say. With, with, that, with the introduction of a lot more private sector players, you're seeing an increase in employment at different levels or at different segments of the value chain. Um, so th that has been the result. All right, so with the yearly input disbursement program that AFEX has run for mm -hmm. over five years, what has been the growth and the responses from small, uh, smallholder farmers? And then what is the 2021 AFEX input disbursement program aiming towards this year? Uh, oh, thank you very much for that question because I've been waiting for it. Um, so our input disbursement program, our disbursement program has been massively successful. And when I mean massively successful, I mean massively successful. I mean, we started in the year 2015 with just approximately 800 farmers. Last year alone, we did more than 35,000 farmers, right? That's a growth of more than 35,000%, uh, right? I'm, I mean... More, I mean, it's significant, 4,500% uh, 4, rather, right? And if you look at what has happened in that sector, you, we have seen as a company, we have seen significant growth in the number of farmers that we're able to reach on a yearly basis, go from year on year, right? So like I said, last year, we were able to reach 35,000 farmers, but even more so beyond that, because for us at Apex Commodities Exchange, our value is the ability to play across the different, uh, uh, the different parts of the value chain, both from an access to finance standpoint, and also in terms of providing quality inputs to the farmers in a timely manner and I accentuate the word timely right because it's not just important for you to be to, for you to be able to provide inputs to farmers it's important for you to be able to provide it to them in a timely manner right and we also have an extensive warehouse networks that allows us to provide last mile delivery right to the small older farmers and and even beyond that right we also provide extension services to all the small older farmers that ensures that they can significantly increase their productivity and increase their livelihood. I mean, we recently did an impact report at the company and it sufficiently demonstrated that farmers that have worked with Apex Morrison's Exchange for the better part of two or three years have significantly seen an increase in, the, in, in their income and their livelihood. So if we're talking about the success of the program, I mean, mm. we also even have a 98% loan repayment rate. So, I mean, if anything at all, I think people should be lining up to give us money for our, I mean, for our input disbursement program. Our plans for 2021 is to reach more than 150,000 uh, 150, farmers. I mean, that's massive on any scale. Right? And we believe that with the current people that we have uh, on the exchange and with the current net warehouse networks that we have with, the, with our partners in the, uh, in the capital market, we'll, I mean, that number is, is, is not a challenge to us. Oh, well, Martin, I, I don't know if uh, Ladi and I have that kind of money to, <laughs> to take my to money. Get but yes, maybe Ladi can actually offer some Bitcoin there. All right, thank you, we uh, don't Michael. Mind. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> thank you for your time, uh, Michael. We'll take a moment now. We'll be yep. back. All right, let's look at the market uh, with Edi Jong Ewan. Hi, Edi. Well, the green sentiment uh, wasn't sustained yesterday. We saw a dip there. And uh, just wondering, Seplet floating, the LSE and the NSA, the bond, and that uh, didn't have quite impact on the market. Wondering why. Good morning, Jimmy. You're right. I mean, yesterday, as I entered day, the market was still in the green, but then Dangote Cement dragged the market down with a 4% decline yesterday. Now, unfortunately, uh, the good news from Sepla didn't have much impact because the oil and gas sector didn't even make any changes. Uh, hopefully, maybe we'll see some reactions to that today. There were also, uh, we saw Bar Cement release its earnings yesterday. Investors didn't have time to react to that yesterday. So hopefully, these are some of the things we should be seeing investors react to in the market today but yesterday the all share index was down 0 0.57 percent at 39,267.11 points while the market cap was at 20.554 trillion naira. but then to talk more about the trading yesterday is Tajuddin Olainka a stockbroker at Valmont Securities good morning Mr. Olainka thank you for joining us on the program yeah good morning everyone we saw Bar Cement's earnings released uh, yesterday in the market. What do you make of those numbers, and how do you think investors are likely to react today? 
Well, um, the numbers are still good. I mean, if you look, if you look back to what some of those companies released uh, in their in their in their top quarter, the uh, 2020 top quarter. I mean, some of them, like Cadbury, they, they, they came up with something that is that is still positive. So even though it's not much, it's, it's something good. At the end of the day, if you look at the uh, activity in the market over the past five trading sessions, you see that uh, there has been some positive movement. So, uh, so occasionally we are, we are also seeing, uh, uh, you know, some stock losing in prices, even though they are very few. So for me, I, I, I would say that uh, uh, you know, market, market is still. Uh, the market is still on the part of the you know cost of trading, especially you know when when investors don't have full information as to what future earnings of this company to be. Especially you know when you have to look at uh, the, the cost pressure on the economy. So uh, you know market is still moving on uh, on that stage. It's not you, 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 you can't you, you can't say it's going to be bullish or it's going to be bearish, but you still have to balance market you know you, you know going forward. So I mean. You've made a good point there, but then this morning, I mean, trading bagging um, began some minutes ago. So, what's the sentiment like in the market this morning? Just, just like what you saw yesterday, uh, you know, that that actually caused the market to lose, you know, that one that we saw. Because if you look at it, in, uh, you know, if you look at all all the all the metrics that you know that you can, that, that you can consider, if you look at the state of the market for both, uh, 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 you know. 50 most traded stocks for, for both 50, uh, you know, highest followers. As you look at everything, you see that uh, the, the, the breadth of the market was, was, quite positive, was quite positive and strong. So the same thing is happening this morning. We, we, we have everywhere stock like, like, like uh, MTN, you know, depressing the share prices. So it's, it's, still, it's still a little call, but right now, you know, you know, the market is down, basically because of MTN, you know, that does drop in price. Generally, there, there, there is no serious issue in the market at, you know, at this moment. All right, Mr. Thank you for your input on the program. Tajjin Olainka is a stockbroker at Valmont Securities. Well, just before we end up with that, uh, let's just quickly look at the market numbers. The sectoral performance was mixed. The banking sector was up on the back of gains from Zenith Bank, GT Bank, and uh, UBA. Consumer goods was up. Industrial goods was down due to the declines from Dangote Cement. Hopefully, insurance to have... Hopefully, investors will have some time to react to the earnings from Boa Cement. So hopefully, that will push that counter up today, while insurance was down 0.16%. So, Chimi, there's a primary market auction today for Treasury bills. So we're expecting that market to be quiet today, as all attention is going to be on that. Mm. But the bond market has continued to see yields rise in that space. So we'll just see how things play out. And uh, perhaps that is also impacting the equities market continuously where that has always been the issue for some time now but we keep our fingers crossed and um, only hope for the best okay we take a break and um, we get our london morning calls when we come back as the updated data from the office for national statistics shows that uk gdp rose by 1.3 percent in october to december Just stay with us And for updates from London, let's talk to Juliana now. Juliana, great to have you. Uh, level of GDP in the UK is now 7.3% below its uh, quarter of 2019 level, uh, revised from the previous estimate of 7.8%. Uh, what are the early reactions to the revised uh, UK GDP figures? Uh, good morning, Laddie. To be honest, not much. Um, you know, we're looking in the rearview mirror. Um, the Office for National Statistics always uh, do this. So we do know uh, that rather than a 9.9% fall in 2020, the UK economy fell 9.8%. Um, this is still the biggest collapse in uh, more than 300 years. But it does reiterate and double down on the fact that despite um, some intermittent starts and stopping and starting of the economy, the, the second half of 2020, uh, there was a a little bit of a bounce back. I think now um, the economists are really looking uh, for what we can expect for Q1. We had January uh, GDP figures showing um, that GDP fell 2.9%. I believe on the 12th of April we're expecting um, a little bit of a bounce back in February and uh, considering the PMI um, statistics are showing that the private sector is performing well um, and we had um, better than expected unemployment figures. Uh, hopefully, I think Rishi Shunak will be crossing his fingers uh, that the worst is behind us.
Anyway, Deliveroo is still in the news. Shares in the meal uh, delivery company are slumping as it makes its uh, debut on the London uh, Stock Exchange today. A remarkably bad start to Deliveroo's uh, new role as a listed company, right? Absolutely. This is the biggest business story um, of uh, the day, possibly of the year. Uh, really, really a cold uh, slap down to earth uh, for uh, Deliveroo. Um, £2.3 billion was wiped off their market capitalisation in about three or four minutes. I think their shares plummeted more than 30%. And it's really shameful for uh, Deliveroo. You know, this was being billed as the IPO of uh, the decade. Even the Chancellor, Rishi Shunak, went the press release um, on the prospectus was delivered a couple of weeks ago. He even put his name on it. That's how proud um, the British government were of uh, this listing. But, you know, they've been coming under a lot of flack, especially because of um, the kind of changing attitude towards the gig economy, especially in the pandemic. They've been so busy, these riders, and people don't believe they've been given uh, the money that they deserve. Deliveroo has been in and out of court over the past couple of years. They've even put aside about £122 million pounds to deal with upcoming court cases in Europe and of course this is uh, shown today as investors have run and sold off their shares. Mm, incredible who knows maybe Ine and Chimi might be buying the dip there but <laughs> we'll see. Well the, the, the fallout from the collapse of Archegos Capital Management continues with UK and uh, US regulators reportedly examining whether global investment banks uh, breach rules by holding our group discussion shortly before launching a fire sale of nearly $20 billion uh, worth of assets. Uh, what's the update on this? No update, I'm afraid. Um, I, I, I read the story. There hasn't really been much detail. We know there is, of course, going to be lots of fallout um, from uh, the liquidization of Archegos, uh, considering just how many um, uh, banks um, had some sort of um, regulatory relationship with them. Uh, what's been said is that just before the mass sell-off on Friday, um, top bankers had um, discussions with the Huang family, according to the Financial Times. Uh, these conversations were to try and limit uh, some of the ramifications of uh, the mass sell-off. Is that legal? Is that not legal? You know, that's for the elite um, to decide. So expecting uh, to hear some information from them. The reason why the Financial Conduct Authority, the city regulator here in London, are getting involved because, is because a lot of these big banks like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, etc., all have um, uh, uh, offices here in the UK. So they'll also be doing um, due regulation just to make sure that everything was above board. OK, I guess we'll keep uh, tracking that story. All right, Juliana, always great to talk to you. Thank you for the update. Thank you, Laddie. All right, uh, let's uh, look at the crypto market now with Ini. Ini, Deliveroo, are you buying the dip? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'll stick with equities and then I'll do crypto. I think I'm right? good with that. Oh, okay. right. I don't want to spread thin. <laughs> <laughs> I leave that to you, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's see what's happening. Well, uh, market cap went up 2.99%, uh, uh, and uh, it's at $1.88 trillion. And, uh, well, Bitcoin is, is getting a lot of attention these days. Uh, it's, uh, it's up 0.23%, uh, and the dominance is 59.28%. And now this might not be unconnected with the fact that PayPal Holdings have said that customers who hold Bitcoin, either Bitcoin Cash, Litecoin in PayPal digital wallet, will not be able to convert their holdings into fiat currencies. And uh, that's including what Visa had already said before now. So that should be part of what is making Bitcoin, you know, settle down in the market very well. Going to the price of Bitcoin is getting back to 60 so for those who have it you might be getting ready to maybe sell and make your profit we don't know remember what uh, Wilfred said yesterday let's not be too greedy well 24 hours volume is 54.88 billion dollars and then ethereum is also enjoying part of this so it's not just bitcoin that is getting the attention of the institution's uh, adoption also, Ethereum is enjoying that, so we see it go up by 2.56% at 1,859. Still yet to hit the highest that it did in February, though. 24-hour volume, 22.661 billion dollars, and then top all by market cap, BNB. 
is up 12.59%. Uh, Ada is also is down, sorry, 0.32%. Well, uh, we have Rume Ofi, who is a blockchain expert, to tell us what he thinks, um, especially about XRP. XRP is looking bullish, but also in the U.S., we have XRP versus the Ripple lawsuit has been on for a while, and we see it go down in spite of the fact that the court has said that SEC cannot stop holders from being part of the Ripple lawsuit, which has been on for a while. Well, good morning, Ruben. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Nice to yeah. meet you. And nice so, to have me. Thank you. So I'm sure you've been following the story for a while. What do you think about it? So now the court has said that the holders can join in the, in the lawsuit, the Ripple lawsuit in the U.S.? Uh, I, I think what is happening to Ripple is um, what actually Satoshi Nakamoto saw while he went, uh, he remained anonymous, you know. Uh, I think the U.S. has a way, the U.S. Tech has a way of making things difficult for projects like this. Uh, actually, it was more or less like writing Ripple off, that um, it was unregistered security, and thank God the, the court has intervened to look at setting um, fires, motions, to see how Ripple, the suit, can be, uh, going to their favor, and I still like the fact that in, with, in, in, in as much as all of these issues are coming for Ripple, Ripple mm. is still are staying strong. Not because I had some bags of Ripple, but because <laughs> there's a feature in Ripple. You are sentimentally attached yeah. to it, Rumen. No, no, no. no. <laughs> Aside that, yesterday Ripple actually got a stake of 40% in one of the payment um, firms, mm. Stranglo, uh, and, and that company is a very big company. They have been able to put um, to processed about 20 million transactions which about okay okay all right Rumer, just just before we get out of time you we, we also hear of paypal holdings you know giving attention to bitcoin and all that tell us how does it work really when they say you know people have wallets paypal wallet can cash out fiat currencies how does it work what's the working of it all right beautiful uh paypal is uh like a payment gateway uh like other payment gateway that we have here in our um, in our, co our country, uh, so what 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 the how it works is, for example, there's a site you want to go get. Let's say you want to get some pairs of shoes, or maybe you want to get a bag or something. Then they they will check out and see if there's a payment um, platform like uh, PayPal. So what you just need to do is to click and see the various um, payment portals, the various platforms that they usually used to have, like Visa. Chase and American Express, then you check and see Bitcoin or Ethereum or Paradenture Litecoin. You will just click it. But before then, your PayPal account should be funded with Bitcoin. Then when you click it, it automatically pays for that goods that you actually are uh, making purchases for with Bitcoin. So it sells your Bitcoin in the fiat equivalent for you to make that possible to mm. be able to so get your so product. So with the scenario in Nigeria, is this applicable to PayPal holders in Nigeria? Uh, actually, I think PayPal started this first and foremost with uh, the U.S. citizens. I think uh, the U.S. customers, you know, uh, PayPal actually has about 60, 360 million active customers. But in the Nigeria scenario, I think uh, there's a bit of, uh, Nigeria is a bit blacklisted, kind of, because PayPal doesn't really work effectively. Yeah. Uh, you can have a PayPal account here, yeah, but uh, you can do a bit of payment, but you can't do a free phone. So I think there's a bit of uh, disparity in the, the users of PayPal in Nigeria. So but the fact that it has started in the U.S., maybe probably we could see some new development in, uh, co in our country. All right. We'll be, we'll be looking forward to that. All right. Thank you so much, Rume, for joining thank us you, this thank morning. You Thank yeah, Rumen Ofi is a blockchain expert and he just shared his opinion. Well, just before I hand uh, back to Ladi, um, XRP is looking really bullish, not a financial advice, I must tell you. Um, technical anal analysis says that there are good days coming because it hasn't really had a lot of move before now. And then top five gainers, uh, BTT, CKP, well, Ladi. <laughs> well, uh, perhaps that's I'm not XRP. telling you. Yes, you, you, you told me this morning yes. that that news is actually bullish. For, exactly for, for that coin yeah mm -hmm. so uh, you, you need to choose where you stand at this point with xrp mm -hmm. because if it if it goes against xrp you're going the price will dump for sure mm -hmm. but if it goes in their favor we might see a pump so, i guess we have to yeah. keep an eye on that yeah, case mm -hmm. there. Definitely. all right that's a wrap on the program for today thank you for watching i'm chimizu obi Iwago. and i'm ladi williams thanks for watching